Racing games, once synonymous with the gaming industry, a genre which showcased technological feats and innovations now finds itself pushed to the side, forgotten, and at worst, met with near apathy. Oh, it's oh. cars. Hey, yes, come on. Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> what happened to this genre? Fewer releases, disinterest, and more dead IP than in Konami's backyard. Who's to blame here? Is it on the industry, the players, or is a conspiracy from the Illuminati to kill the genre so younger players are disinterested in cars, therefore purchasing less cars when they get older, and we all stop driving? Okay, probably not that one, but the genre isn't in a healthy state, and it hasn't been for quite a while. Sit down! How you feel? From the earliest days of gaming, we've wanted to experience the thrills of fast driving, the fantasy of supercar ownership, and escape from the police. Wipeout, Ridge Racer, and of course, Gran Turismo gained traction becoming household names and system sellers. Midtown Madness and Driver pushed what was possible in regards to damage modeling and open worlds in 3D space. These games made an impact because they pushed technological boundaries, offered new and unique experience, and possessed style which had never been seen before. And above all else, they were fun. Easy to pick up and hard to master. The foundations during the fifth generation of gaming would carry us on into the next, the golden era. Burnout, Ridge Racer, Midnight Club, Rally Sport Challenge, Need for Speed, Double Steel, Stuntman. Alto Mona Lisa! What do all these games and more have in common? You can't mistake one for another. By many, this is considered the golden era of racing games. Developers are no longer constrained by the early 3D and the PS1 era, and with more power came more ambition. Even those who tried to copy Gran Turismo's success attempted to bring something new to the table, whether it be presentation or progression. Development times were also shorter back then, so it wasn't unreasonable to get yearly or bi-yearly releases, meaning games could be iterated upon quicker as developers found what worked and got more accustomed to the hardware with each subsequent entry. The games of this era had a lot on offer, from customization never seen before, previously unmatched scale, and diverse game modes. Everything was new and everything was fresh. This is why the sixth generation is looked back upon so fondly, as no matter what your tastes were, you had plenty of options. It wasn't just about car or track lists, it was about what you wanted to play and how you wanted to help play it. You want to cause as much chaos as possible? Burnout, flat out, twisted metal, take your pick. Into underground street racing? Plenty of options here. Midnight club too much of a challenge? Maybe underground's more your speed. Or maybe even juiced if your parents aren't around. Now, not every game was a hit, or in fact a masterpiece. But the point remains that the genre had diversity and attempts at innovation. This was the generation that gave us the modern FPS. The foundation for the modern open world. So why did it not set the marks for what racing games would become? Don't you know any shortcuts? You want shortcuts? Well, I'll show you some shortcuts. All genres go through peaks and valleys as trends and tastes change. At this point, in retrospect, you might have expected people to move on as we enter the HD era of consoles. But that wasn't the case. Expectations shifted, not from the players, but from corpos. The games industry faced a number of challenges in the 7th generation. Consoles were again more powerful, but TVs were crisper, clearer. You could see more detail, and such things that could be hidden on a standard definition TV, such as poor draw distance, lower polygon models, and blurry textures were no longer going to fly, meaning that instead of spending time and money on new ways to play, the efforts were spent on visuals. Cars became more detailed, lighting was more realistic, and the environments looked better than ever. But what did we lose? This increase in fidelity also means an increase in development costs and time. This also means that the expectation of sales also increased. As I mentioned previously, it wasn't unreasonable to get a new game every one or two years. But the publishers seemingly didn't want to accept that this leap in visual quality meant an increase in development time. So on the side of the developers, what else could be done but reduce the scope and ambition? Need for Speed didn't have enough time to bake. Well, maybe it baked too long in a different area. And suddenly, it was no longer fine for a game to simply be profitable. Sales had to eclipse the budget, 
and were compared with other games within a published portfolio, ignoring differences in genre and audience. Tokyo Extreme Racer went from a series with multiple releases and spin-offs to a single entry on 7th gen systems. Ridge Racer, which had been dabbling in spin-offs during the 6th generation, mostly only appeared for console launches. It may sound like the 7th generation is where the genre lost its way, but from the player's perspective, we didn't really see this as the games which released were still high quality. Eating Games Test Drive Unlimited brought Test Drive back from irrelevancy. Dirt and Grid evolved from Toka Race Driver and Colin McRae Rally respectively. Driver also reinvented itself after a long hiatus. Motorstorm, Horizon, Blur, and Split Second all entered the market and all excelled at what they set out to do. So what happened? Why is this generation where the genre declined? <laughs> Hi, I'm Jeff Gordon. While development teams got bigger and budgets raised, what a lot of developers didn't get is time. Couple that with sales expectations from publishers, everything that wasn't making Call of Duty or Assassin's Creed numbers was considered a failure, both within the racing genre and outside. Developers were rushed. Even if their games found success, they were no longer considered successes in the eyes of the overlords. But some struck back. In recent years, Games media and players have been very outspoken against crunch, when comments from Dan Hauser about 100 hour work weeks on Red Dead Redemption 2 became viral. But these issues stem way back. Rockstar San Diego, who made Midnight Club, suffered through rough working conditions and broken promises from upper management during development of Midnight Club Los Angeles and Red Dead Redemption. Eden Games, who made Test Drive Unlimited, went on strike due to breach of contract and poor working conditions under Atari having their budget and development time cut due to wider mismanagement, thus being forced to crunch on two large-scale projects and not being paid out for their efforts. The taste of the wider market also shifted. While many tried to capture Gran Turismo's success in the sixth generation, this wasn't a short-lived fad. The rise of the Syncade came about, and no longer did people want to earn kudos, use crash breakers, or do 360s. They wanted accessible and realistic racing titles to go along with their more gritty and realistic shooters. Microsoft saw this coming. Spinning up Turn 10 Studios to develop Forza Motorsport when Project Gotham Racing at the time was still doing well. Grid found greater success with its reimagining of the Toka Race Driver series, and its successor, the more arcaded Grid 2, did not. Motorstorm found early success, but the odds eventually became stacked against the series, and the third mainline and final entry was the worst performing of the bunch. Open world games were also all the rage at the time. As Forza Horizon would later prove, not only did player taste shift towards more realistic driving for their track racers, it also affected their taste and attitude towards open world racers. So there you have it. That's the death of the arcade racer as we knew it. Apart from Microsoft, hardly anyone saw this shift coming. Which meant, when it came to the competition, games such as Blur and Split Second were competing with a dwindling market and in their specific case as well, releasing at nearly the same time, which didn't help either's cause. They were fighting over scraps for a market which was quickly dwindling. Publishers wanted larger sales numbers, an increase in quality, and quicker releases. And players wanted more realistic and gritty experiences. If you're watching this video, that player isn't you. That player is someone who will never watch this video or perhaps even engage in video game discourse, which makes up the majority of sales. Eating Games, unable to reach a deal with Atari, ended up closing its doors, as did Bizarre Creations and Black Rock Studio. The majority of Midnight Club staff left Rockstar San Diego, Genki stopped developing its Tokyo Extreme Racer series, and DICE, for a while, found greener pastures. Many more franchises either died or lost their developers. So moving on to the 8th generation of consoles, things were not looking optimistic. As the 8th generation of consoles approached, things weren't looking too great for the racing genre. Across the industry, the 7th generation laid waste to multiple publishers and developers. The 8th generation was kickstarted with Forza Motorsport 5, a cut down copy of the previous entry, rushed out to make the launch of the Xbox One. Similarly, Need for Speed Rivals was also rushed to the market, being developed in only 9 months, and it showed. Some games would find success during this generation, however. Forza Horizon, the crew, and Dirt Rally, but the ones that truly deserved it, in my opinion, didn't. But what's wrong with the racing games of this generation? 
Well, in short, the genre just hasn't moved forward. There's less investment in development, meaning that the most that can happen is the bare minimum. And why should there be innovation when recycled formulas seem to work? The only way for things to get better is just a change in taste from the wider market. And again, if you're watching this video and made it this far, that's not you. More interest in the racing genre and more interest in various styles of racing will result in more varied games. But if there's seemingly no demand from the wider market, then what justifies the investment to truly bring something new to the table? Especially when those that have tried didn't find success. There are games which have released recently and are upcoming which you should check out. Trail Out, Solar Crown, Drive By, V Rally 4, and World Racing 2. That last one, by the way, is one of the few instances of a racing game being re-released, so please support that. But even these, as great as they are, are mostly just trying to recapture the past instead of pushing the genre forward. There's nothing wrong with nostalgia. In fact, nostalgia sells. And in the case of racing games, a lot of it isn't misplaced. But the issue here is that nostalgia isn't enough to support a whole genre in its future. We've yet to see what the upcoming Test Drive Unlimited Solar Crown and the Crew Motor Fest are bringing to the table. But it's clear that what people want is something beyond the glory days. Something truly fresh, like other genres have had. Will we ever get that spark which this genre needs? Only time will tell.